So, David, uh, welcome back. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, I, I've kind of been around the markets for a long time, like you, and maybe you could just tell some of the people that are coming into it that, you know, weren't around for the Hunt's Silver Squeeze, a hmm. little bit about your background. Okay, well, I'm long-winded at times. I'll try to keep it succinct, but I was 11 years old when Lyndon Johnson took silver out of the currency. So we went from 90% uh, silver coins to what I call Johnson slugs. And no, none of the adults seem to pay much attention to that, but I noted it. It seemed like, you know, the two can't be equal in value. So you, for fast forward years ahead, I came kind of obsessed about money and started studying on my own. And once I discovered how the banking system worked, then I realized that, um, we could be in trouble in the future, but I didn't, again, obsess about it, didn't think a lot about it. My main career when I was in school was actually a pilot. I worked for a couple of large aircraft companies, one uh, actually <laughs> on the black side in the uh, skunk works, but that's a side story. So I was fascinated by the markets. From the time I was 16, I was allowed to trade. I got the Uniform Gift of Miners Act, and so that's been my passion from okay. basically the day I was born till now. Uh, left the aircraft industry pretty early on and focused primarily on investing and trading. I'm a position trader. I'm not a day trader, uh, not too much of a swing trader, but I've always had the adage, like the great late Richard Russell, that markets know more than anyone. And whether or not the price got there by manipulation or breaking news or whatever, really doesn't matter that much in the aggregate because the price is the price. And we can only agree on that. We can argue about why or how or any of that. It doesn't really matter when there's more selling than buying prices go down. And when you're selling silver or selling soybeans, the, the commodity never asked the question, why are you selling me? I mean, that's as simple as I can make it. Yeah. It's I, people voting with their wallet, David. Exactly. And that's what we get to see in the chart. So I also apply fundamentals, which I know there's pure technicians, I know there's pure fundamentalists, and I know there's arguments on both sides. I mean, there's, the pure technicians will say that, they're, that fundamentals are funty, funny mentals. You know, you're kidding yourself like you know more because you know the fundamentals of a given asset, a given commodity, or even a stock. And then, of course, the uh, pure fundamentalists say, well, those are just a bunch of squiggly lines, and you don't know exactly until you look behind you. And there's some merit in that as well. So <clears throat> I know from 40 years of experience and being obsessed about markets and market movement and, and money in general, um, both are useful. So I approached two ways. So the reason I started with copper when I, I caught the end of uh, the previous presentation, someone in the audience that hopefully stuck around for me asked about copper. Copper is called Dr. Copper, and it's yeah. a good indicator. And I don't think now... It's as good as oil, but still I think it's, it's valid. And the reason it's Dr. Copper is it's a pretty accurate indicator of long-term economic health on a global basis. Well, what is Yeah, that? you know, uh, back at the beginning of uh, the year when we were trading over three bucks, I think Dr. Copper got hit with a malpractice suit for impersonating a bull market. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can see it on the chart here. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good one. You're right. I mean, uh, anyway, I, I don't know if they settled or not. But yeah. So what are you seeing here, David? I mean, well, it almost looks like we could come out of here to the upside. It's possible, now, but my overall thesis is this. Bearish. Until we break through the th 330 level, which okay. is the top of the chart and a double top there. Yeah. Uh, can you see my cursor when I move it? Yeah. Okay, so we got a top there and a double top there. And so double tops are more powerful to the downside than a single top. So we've got this, you know, double top here, and then we fell, we rallied up. We did go above it, so that would, and I'm not a big Elliott guy, but it looks like, oh, we might have made it. As you said, we got above three bucks and false breakout is what I call it. The yeah. point I'm making is this. I think and believe and stress that, the overall economic health of the world is contracting, not expanding. And the only way you could ever pay off this debt in the United States and all these other major countries, pick a European country of your choice, it doesn't matter. Take the Eurozone, any that are on the Euro, it doesn't matter. No one is producing enough real growth to be able to pay off what they owe, which means there's going to be a default of some type. You either default by saying, hey, I can't pay my bills, or you take 
you know, 50 cents on the dollar, we can settle it out. Or in the government's case, in almost all cases where you're not on a gold standard, you just print and print and print until the money becomes worth less and worth less, and then it's finally worthless, which is what the South American countries experience yeah, all like, the time. Uh, yeah, Argentina now, again yeah. Uh, last week. Let me ask you this, David. Sure. You've been around the uh, block a few times like me. Uh, do you read into the selection of Christine Lagarde to head up the ECB as exactly what you were talking about. She has experience with restructuring debt through the IMF with countries that have had debt crises, and maybe that's another reason why she's going to be heading up the ECB. Exactly. No, I concur completely. I think that we're going to have, we are going to have a reset, whether it's by design or, or the financial mother nature, it's going to happen. And I also believe it's going to happen probably within the next five years. I don't think you can push the paper paradigm much further than we already have. Do you think we'll go to negative rates here to keep it going? I do not. Okay. I think the dollar will be the bastion of last resort, and everyone's going to flood into the dollar, and gold will be going up concurrent with the dollar. And a lot of, a lot of my ilk, a lot of my peers and compadres will be saying, what the hell's going on? Gold's going up like crazy, but so is the dollar. And well, all they have to do is look at the last six months. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, it's been happening. So, what you know? Uh, in fact, uh, isn't that uh, gold thriving in a potentially deflationary environment like it did in the '30s? Exactly. And on top of that, it's uh, a liquidity squeeze that John Exter was so eloquent about teaching us that when you stop trusting the derivatives, you stop trusting corporate bonds are all junk, you know, for the most part, you stop trusting even the T-bond. The they're not going to pay me back real money in 30 years or 10 years, or even a 10-year note. I don't want to risk my money for that. And when that happens and you run to the most liquid thing possible and for 98.7% of the planet, that means currency in their hand. And yeah. when you're in Argentina, you want a U.S. dollar. You don't want the, the Bolivar. You want to have a dollar. And so there'll yeah. be a huge rush there. The problem is when that rush happens, there'll be a point in my studied view when you say, I don't want this either. This is losing value. It sure did better than the Bolivar, and I'm glad I moved into it. But now it's not really protecting me. I need to get some gold. Okay. I think that's what uh, I'd like your reaction also which is kind of uh, a new event that's really uh, never happened in this way. Um, you talk about liquidity squeeze. Uh, what is your belief that's behind what's happening in the overnight market, the repo market, where banks have to pay up almost double for overnight funds when the narrative previously to this was U.S. banks are fine. We did the hard work and we cleaned up our balance sheets in our financial system compared to Europe. Why is there stress in the repo market and the overnight Fed funds market? Uh, this is conjecture because I don't know for a everyone. Fact. Yeah, I know. It, yeah, I'm just making sure. Educated conjecture. I'm, very, I'm interested. Well, I'm very well trusted, and people trust me. And you know, they ask me some of these questions about subjects I know nothing about. But well, I mean, how many people have a silver dollar named after them? Kennedy and yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you. So <laughs> the Morgan silver dollar. There we go. That must have been a big day in your life, wasn't oh, it? Oh, man. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so what's I, going on I there? Really it's, not, do, yeah. it's not the corporations are squeezed for uh, tax payments. and their No, that's a, that, that's a red herring, of course. Okay. No, there's some very large insolvencies in the banking system. And okay. since these banks are inextricably connected to each other, it's a domino effect. And if you look at these domino games where one domino hits the next, hits the next, and a long chain fall down. In the banking system, everything is so leveraged. It's really an exponential function. So it's one domino hits two, hits four, hits eight, yeah. hits 16. If one goes, it's not going to go two more go. It's going to go like they all go, more or less. I'm using that as a metaphor, but that's very much more accurate. So there is some huge insolvency out there. And this is where we were in 2008 in a different way. What happened in 2008 is the banks didn't trust each other and the banking system actually seized up. Yeah. There was no real currency 
trading between banks because they just didn't trust each other. The Fed, good or bad, came in immediately. And if had they paused or thought it over or elected a committee to decide or any of that stuff, we probably would have had a much worse situation than what we had because what took place was the Fed immediately came in and said, you know those bad mortgages that are really pieces of crap? Well, give us those and we'll give you these T-bills. And they did that to all the banks. And therefore, and everybody trusts the T-bill that's you know the best out there. So they've replaced garbage with coveted, well-respected money, quote unquote, and kept the system going. This time what's happening is the banks don't trust each other. They're not sure even overnight if they're going to get their money back. This is huge. Most people don't understand it, which means they've got to go to the Fed, which they trust. So this is the walk of shame. Banks don't go to the Fed unless they have to because it shows that they probably have a solvency problem and don't have enough money on. The, first of all, to be in a repo market and have to borrow means you don't have the reserve requirement that night. You have to have it by law. So that means you've got to go okay. borrow overnight. It happens all the time. It's happened for years. It's a whole market called the repo market. And it's just the course of doing business. And there's lots of reasons and not tax payments. Okay. okay. But if okay. a bank says, I need to borrow, and the bank A says, I need to borrow, bank B says, oh, I'm not going to loan to you. Not even overnight. Bank C says, no, D, E, F, G. Then they go, oh, we got to meet the reserve requirements. Go to the Fed, which is allowed to go to the discount when they borrow overnight. That's a bank. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is it's lots of banks, and it's a lot of banks that won't loan to other banks. So there's a huge something going on. I mean, there could be a derivative fault in the background that we don't know about, that somebody out there in, in the big finance has defaulted. And so that means that bank is persona non grata. Well, as I just said, and I want to clarify, you could go and say Bank A uh, – failed and the banks are keeping it quiet or, or they're, they're not, it's not trusted for what well, fails maybe too strong words. So bank A isn't trusted. So then what happens is these other banks look at, well, what is the biggest partner of bank A? You know, if it's bank of America, as an example, I'm not saying it is, then who's got the biggest book with them? Oh, it's Wells Fargo. Well, I'm not going to do with Wells Fargo because they've done, you know, 60% of their stuff with bank of America. And then you go to Wells Fargo. Who do they do the most with? Well, they do it most with, um, I don't know, the Bank of France or Centaur Bank or whatever. And see, this is how it goes. So it's sort of like the social credit rating in China. If you're a, a no good Nick and you're ostracized and your credit score goes down, your social credit score goes down, you don't want to associate with that person because your social credit score will go down. So I hope yeah. I did a good explanation. That was uh, uh, really, and, and I learned, okay? I didn't know it was law. So uh, what a great explanation. So let's now get to, you know, you we've talked about things in the background. Let's get to silver, David. Yeah, let's uh, get there. So uh, one more quick comment on copper. Okay. So what I'm saying and have said for some time for everybody out there that looks toward the fundamentals is copper is saying to me that the next move up in in uh, finance is going to be precious metals only. Now I'm lying because I think the ags are going to soar because there's a food shortage coming. Yeah. But what I'm saying is there is not going to be another resurrection of the commodities boom that we saw in the early 2000s because of China. That's not happening. What's going to happen is you're going to get the real needs, which are going to be food, water, Feel. Uh, even shelter is going to come down. Housing prices are still overextended in a lot of areas. So copper is saying to overextended. Me that, they're at new highs here yeah, on the coast. They insane. took out the 08 highs. It's crazy. I mean, I live in a very conservative area and we don't get that kind of movement in the housing okay. market here. So I'm a little, I, I'm aware of it, but not, I didn't know that. So thanks for educating me. I so uh, anyway, if we take out 250, uh, you're talking about, and I remember copper. Uh, you know, I've been around long enough, copper trading under a buck. So, yeah. okay. Uh, and one other thing before I forget, um, we had a nice move from, I don't know, about 92, 93 in the gold-silver ratio. Um, do you think that was the peak? No. And, no? Uh, no, I think okay. we're – I'm not a huge Elliott guy, but I, I believe in the overall theory of it. Yeah. And so there's a five wave. So there's three waves up and two correction waves. Yeah. So as far as I can tell, we've had our 
our uh, two uh, waves up and we're finishing the, the fourth wave, the correction wave. And we've broken out of that at 1350 gold that I'm showing here on this chart. Yeah. And we are ready to go up. And the third wave up is usually the money uh, wave, the big one. So whatever yeah. the second wave did, which I think is from here to here, in gold so you go from 700 to 1950 so i'm going to call 700 to 1700 i'm going to excuse a thousand because i do the math in my head really quickly okay so the next wave is usually double or triple that wave so say you have a thousand dollar move you've got a two thousand or a three thousand dollar move this is a rule of thumb i'm not from 1050 from this point so you're going to go oh, from okay. 1350 up 3000 more which is 40 That's how people 50. get 4500 five yeah. grand. Yeah. Okay. So had 11 year bull market uh, this 2008 crisis on this scale looks uh, like a big correction and it was but you could see time wise it didn't last long it was like oh my god you know things are going to hell oh fed comes in rescues the mission give you a good paper for bad things go on we we'll come right back up and then we make a new high would close us back under 1350 change your view it would okay it would. because it's always this good when six, it's, this is a six year right top six years i had to wait for this right and i trade more than gold and i do equities and all that and i'm not trying to make it you know to your credit david i remember i talked to you a couple years ago and uh you said ah no nah, dale i really there's nothing to say uh for a few years you know 2018 2019 things will start to heat up again and you were correct there i mean we went into a dormancy period in precious metals and and you said, uh, you know, just in a couple of years, things will start happening again. And that was, you know, a uh, great gut analysis that you knew uh, there wasn't going to be much to talk about for a year or so. I right. remember our conversation. Oh, yeah. No, it's true. I mean, that's, I do get But then when you contacted me and you were ready to come on and, I, you know, I have some time lag where I could book it, I go, okay. okay. Yeah, uh, this is real. David wants to get out there, and he's putting out the word again. So I appreciate okay. it. Yeah, you've got a great audience, and everyone learns from each other. I mean, there's yeah. no such thing. And a memory. How about that? I can't remember <laughs> what I did yesterday, but I remember you saying nothing's going to happen <laughs> in the battles for a few years. Yeah. Anyway, well, I've taken so many courses on how to trade, and I'm still learning things. And yeah. But uh, I have to tell a joke to everybody because I know it's almost all traders. But uh, when I was in Silicon Valley, which was many years ago, uh, in fact, I was born in San Francisco. That's just an aside. So I've been in the Bay Area a lot. I was uh, connected with this uh, trader that was a day trader. And we became fast friends. We met at an options conference and we ended up having lunch together, came fairly close for a period of time. And he was uh, British, and he was a uh, Cambridge school type, so I can't do a proper Cambridge accent, but he had this joke, and I have to tell because I thought it was the funniest thing going. So let me back. So I'll tell the, the story. So he says, David, David, do you know why we have so many indicators? You know, the Welder Index, the Bollinger Bands, and it goes on and on and on. And I said, well, yeah, I know. We do it for getting an edge on the market, to get an edge on trading, to, to, to be better, to do better, to make more money. Oh, no, no, no. We do all those things so we can impress the girls at the bar. <laughs> yeah, well, now, now you can get, huh? Yeah, yeah keep right. laughing, because there's a point to this. All so right. I've been doing all, I did all that stuff <laughs> and i am down to the absolute basics of basics and my trading is stellar is it perfect no no one's is but mine is extremely good and here's why i threw out about 98.7 percent of that stuff yeah. i look at price and volume so when you said david is this breakout now your previous guest i don't know, put words in his mouth because i didn't get to talk to him i'm as you said with 1350 change your mind the answer is yes it would Here's why I don't think that's going to happen. First of all, it took six years to break out. Secondly, look at the volume. This is the key. If you move on a weak volume, stand back and reappraise or don't enter. When in doubt, stay out. Oh, what did you say, David? When in doubt, stay out. Do I know every time I enter trade that um, it's going to work out? No, I don't. 
But if I have any doubt, I'll stay out. I won't do it. And I have the Morgan three-day rule, which means I have a certain point where I see whatever I'm trading, it has to break out above it or below it. If it breaks okay. above it, I wait three days. Well, David, you missed $27 in the gold market. Yeah, but if I'm a position trader, I'm looking for that gold market to go up $3,000, uh, you know, then I'm not going to worry about losing 25 bucks. believe me. Same you know, thing that's here. one of the most difficult things to do for it traders. It is hard to do. Yeah, go ahead. You know, well, reach. But you know what's even harder? People could say, oh, David, great forecast on silver, great call on it, great trade. But you know the toughest part is a great hold. Yes. Well, I took well, – let's go to silver. Is it, do yeah, you have the, your audience ask questions or not? Yeah, they want to see your silver chart. Okay, let's do that. Forex gal wants to. Okay. And some, Monica said dollars don't want to live in Argentina. <laughs> oh, U.S. dollars. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good yeah. to know. Yeah. Uh, I certainly can learn more. There have been times in the past where they do. But, okay, so here's silver. Pretty messy, as you can see. Silver um, did bottom in 2015. You can't see it, this chart, yeah. but it really touched the bottom. Excuse me, there you can yeah. see it, right? right. So that's the yeah. bottom. Right there, 13 right and there. a half or so. Yeah. And it almost hit that bottom again. Gold didn't do that. Gold kept making higher highs and higher yeah. highs. <clears throat> and so That's the, why the low silver ratio got up to 90. Yeah. I mean, I remember 40 being the mean for gold silver ratio. Yeah, right. So, you know, uh, I'll talk this chart, of course. Uh, 2016, we went from that 1350-ish level all the way up to over 21. And I was pretty convinced fundamentally that that was it. We were where we are now when we were, you know, down in this level, I thought, you know, kept going. The way I trade is, again, I let the market tell me. So I do following stops, you know, stops. And sometimes I get whipsawed out, but not usually my stop is so wide, especially after I have a good profit that, you know, if the market says you're wrong, David, I'm out. But <clears throat> this one, I held all the way up and I got out at the top and we went into September, if I remember correctly. So I held that trade from January to September uh, we did a couple equities because most of my followers and readers, the people that pay me, uh, mostly do equities. I don't want almost to be in the futures market. They just don't have the mental discipline to do it. They don't have ice water in their veins like I earn. Mining shares or ETFs? Well, both. I do, yeah. I do okay. both. I'm, I'm free market. If you would rather do okay. ETFs, I'm pretty good at picking stocks. It's pretty easy to get in and out of. Most people understand them. But they're not as um, geared to the commodity as an ETF is. So there is some more risk if you take on a mining share. Okay. So I was wrong. The market came back down, as we all can see. So here we are again. I think this time it's for real, as I outlined on the gold market. But uh, silver has got some ways to go, I think, to the downside. So let's expand this a little bit, take this thing into like about a one-year time frame and see what it looks like here. Okay, now, now we got a little bit better picture. We had yeah. this rally all the way up. But here's something of concern. Well, on the gold chart, we clearly saw we had big volume, but we don't have that on silver. So that's a caution right there. We had a bit of it here above normal back in September, but it didn't do much. You know, that was some big buying. I mean, that was a pretty big day, but one day doesn't make a market. That was actually so a down day. Yeah, so we got this and back down. So doesn't look good. If you look at my cursor, I'm looking at what I consider to be about the average. So above average, it started up above average, kept going a little above average, and it's still coming down and a down day there. So I, th there's not much congestion here at the 17, 1680 level. I think your previous uh, guy had it at 1677. It was exactly, yeah. and by the way, it makes some really great charts. Mine aren't that great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't make you. Much doesn't make you a better it could make you better i don't want to i just want yeah. to, I don't many ways to, many ways to skin a cat buddy exactly so this is almost a gap here and then we have some more congestion so i actually think we could test this area briefly and follow this area if we okay. fall all the way back down in like the 15 level it's you know high 15s like some congestion here I'm not going to give up on silver, not because I'm stubborn, because I believe what I outlined initially on the fundamental side. Okay. So we're already below the 200-day. Uh, 
So there could be a buying opportunity at six. Another one. We could have another buying opportunity at this level. Okay. Cool. So uh, long term, what do you think? Uh, if uh, silver is in a bull market, could we see it take out fifty bucks? What, yeah, yeah. Here's my. I'm making a new speech, Dale. And this is okay. one of those that's been burbling up inside of me. I mean, you know me fairly well, but not you know super well. So I have had these. Oh, I don't know if they're epiphanies. That may be too strong a word, but I've had these t few times in my career where something's kind of been eating at me and it's rolling around in my head. And one of the ones is the miss in the silver market. If you go to YouTube and type miss in the silver market by David Morgan, or maybe just miss in the silver market, that was one of those that took me like six months, but I got it out and I just, I spoke at one time. I didn't have to edit anything. It was just such a, a yeah. an accumulation of what I wanted to get out. It just, when I, once I opened my mouth, it, it almost said itself. I'm doing something similar. I'm speaking in the New Orleans Gold Show in a few days. And when we get to the ratio, this question has always kind of bothered me because it's one that comes up all the time. And in my view, no one's given a sufficient answer. So I keep thinking and thinking and thinking. So I finally think I've got an answer. You don't have to agree with me, but this is my answer. If you go back to ancient times, you go back into... Uh, maybe I can even get it up since I've got control. I can put up another window, right? Or not. Well, anyway, I'll just speak it. So if you go back, you can see that in ancient Egypt, the gold-silver ratio is five to one. Five ounces of silver bought one ounce of gold. So you go back like four or 5,000 years, the ratio between gold and silver was roughly what I call the natural ratio, of what they, how it's dispersed in the Earth's surface. Okay, And that's a, for centuries and centuries, it was about 12 to 1. So my point is very simple. For thousands of years, you know, 3000 BC, 2000 BC, 1000 BC, BC, to up to 2000, year 2000, or not up to 2000, but up until 1873, the gold-silver ratio traded at the natural ratio because of one thing and one thing only. They both served the same exact function, which was money. Money, yeah money. So to me, with over 4,000 years of history on my side, I would argue strongly that the most important function for silver is money. It's not going in your cell phone. It's not okay. your flat screen TV. It's not your touch keyboard on your laptop. None of those things. They're all important and it's used for that. I'm not debating that. What I'm saying is the highest and best use for silver by the market, not by me, by the market is money. Now, the, the further argument is that, and, I, and Mike Maloney and I are very close friends, but Mike and others in my ilk will tell you that, you know, well, there's a currency disruption every 40 years. And from their criteria, they're correct. But that's not the one I'm talking about. I'm talking about a currency disruption that takes place every few centuries. That's what I'm talking about. And I think that's what we're facing. We're facing a global paradigm where there's going to be a liquidity squeeze that moves down in the U.S. dollar, and then there's a run to gold. And when the run to gold happens, there's going to be a run to silver because when gold starts passing 2,500, 3,000, I don't know the exact number, but there is a tipping point out there that people that can only, ha only have 2,500 bucks in their bank account are not going to run down their coin dealer or find a gold site on the Internet and buy one ounce. They're going to buy silver. And there's a lot more people in that. Poor man's gold. They're going to go for the silver. So yeah. when it re-resurrects re itself as money, which only takes place <clears throat> to this degree every few centuries, but I am forecasting this, there'll be a run into silver like we've never seen. And when that happens, you'll see the ratio go back down and maybe even 10 to 1. You might see $5,000 gold and $500 silver, and I actually believe that's possible. Now, not wow. those numbers, but the idea. If you get okay. a 16 to 1 ratio or a 10 to 1 ratio, if we get $3,000 gold, will that happen or not remains to be determined. I fully admit that. But think about supply and demand. What is the demand on money? I would argue that the demand on money is infinite. Certainly, you see it in hyperinflation. Remember, during the Weimar Republic, there was one cry and one cry only all the way up. And the cry was this. There's not enough money. Think about that. Hyperinflation 
where you take wheelbarrows to get a loaf of bread. And when the wheelbarrow with the, the money is out there on the sidewalk, they someone dump dumps it. the money out and takes the wheelbarrow because it's more valuable. And yet the cry was, there's not enough money. No, 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 no. Yeah. People get it backwards. So what we're going to see, in my views, by study view, is something similar. I don't think we'll ever get to that because the bond market is a natural deflator. I mean, once interest rates are forced up by the market and the Fed loses control, it, bond prices come down, which is a natural deflationary force that's large because there's so much debt out there that's held as safe, and it isn't. And so we're going to have some very, very interesting trying times. But I do believe I'm correct when people have, when the run to gold starts, it, it won't be stopped. There's nothing that the banks can do about it this time. Oh, they can outlaw it and they can tax it and they can put up uh, commercials on television and tell the, you know, the brain. You're unpatriotic. To you know, yeah, you're on it. You're, yeah. But that won't stop it. Nothing will stop it. And oh, there'll be some people, oh, I'm not touching gold. Go, you know, so-and-so told me not to. Well, there'll be a few of those. <laughs> you know, I don't, need, I don't want to stop you. What a great interview. Yeah. Really, well, David, I, really yeah. a great interview. And uh, uh, you really, uh, I learned from you today. I'm sure anyone who was here learned some things from you. And now I know where David Morgan's head is at. And uh, I really appreciate you taking time to address our community, and you know, David, for years, you're already my trading warrior brother. 